All right, let's go ahead and get started. So to start off, I have to tell everybody that I actually really look forward to this one um, because it's story time. I get to tell like story of what actually happened during COVID and it's actually a lot of fun. <laughs> so we're not talking about like boring numbers or anything like that, but just <clears throat> all the interesting things. So I'm only including some of it. Um, there's a lot more. Um, if you want to hear what else has happened, just, you know, you know, we can get together sometime, we can chat, feel free to message me. And with COVID starting to end, um, it's time to do coffee again. So yeah, anything you guys want. Cool. So to start off, disclaimers, um, we're not brokers, agents. Okay. So um, what we're, what we talk about here is purely for educational purpose only. Um, it's not legal advice. Don't sue us. Um, and if you find what these meetups, um, what we share via these meetups are helpful, please join our mailing list. Um, and then we'll have more frequent events. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Um, and you know, if we have deals coming up where we purchase an apartment that uh, everybody can invest in, um, we send it out to our mailing list. So that's the best way to reach us and see um, what, what opportunities are coming down the pipeline. Uh, right now, the market is starting to heat back up with more inventory. So yeah, make sure you get in touch with us. Let us know your interest ahead of time. Okay. Um, I will also be sharing these slides uh, and video later. So if you guys want, just feel free to drop by and uh, yeah, sign up and then I'll send them out. <clears throat> so the agenda today, like, like I was saying, today is storytelling time, um, maybe even like a picture book. Um, so we'll start off with a quick introduction about who we are. Um, then we'll talk about the, you know, the, the impact that COVID has on us. We'll talk about, you know, how did we do the operations during this period of time? How did we apply for government assistance? And how did we still end up evicting people that really needed to be, um, we needed to get out of the apartment, right? Um, what did we do to do to make sure that we have good tenant retention? And how did we actually end up making more money than we did pre-COVID? And finally, um, Song of Fire and Ice, where I'll talk about the Texas freeze and, um, and the fire that catches at the apartment. So that would be pretty interesting. <clears throat> Cool. So um, a little about us, we're, um, so, so SB Mike is basically a large group of out-of-state investors. Uh, most of us are in California, but we have um, investors from all over the United States. And we primarily invest in um, landlord-friendly areas like Texas, where um, there's, you know, where there's good population growth and a good rent growth. Um, so we invest in large apartments, anywhere from like 10 million to $40 million. Um, so obviously none of us can buy one of these apartments alone. So everybody joining together as a group, pitch uh, in the, the, the down payment needed to acquire such property. And we are able then able to share in the profit um, in both the cash flow and the appreciation side of things. So, so far uh, we have acquired about $35 million worth of assets, um, 350 doors uh, in Texas, and we raised over $6 million in funding so far. So, but it's not limited to, the investor base is not limited to California. I get that question a lot, but um, no, it's actually, um, it, um, you know, we, we, we have investors across the United States. So in addition to um, the people who have already invested with us, uh, we also run a meetup as well as um, you know, a Facebook group. So um, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of people who are interested in investing. So right now we have over 500 members. Uh, so we're always looking for opportunities to purchase deals and um, you know, have deals that we can offer everybody. And I, another question I get a lot is on these kind of syndication deals, 
what are like the minimum investments, right? So these syndication deals, whether it's with us or with other people, tend to be anywhere from $50,000 to $100,000 um, to participate. And the profits are split according to um, your share of the, of, of the contribution. Cool. <clears throat> so a little bit about um, us. So my name is Tony. Uh, I lead these syndications. And my background is a Silicon Valley um, software engineer. Uh, I love writing software. I love building things. I'm a hands-on kind of guy. Uh, I'm also, you know, pretty pretty good with numbers. So um, that's why I enjoy uh, running the real estate business. Uh, so I was fortunate enough to go through two successful um, IPOs. I primarily like small companies, um, less than 800 people. So um, yeah. So after I was lucky enough with some of the IPOs, uh, I started to look for different things to invest in to diversify my investments. So I invested in China um, real estate. I also invested here in California, but in the end, um, I decided that China is too risky and um, California is really, really not landlord friendly. So I started to look to invest out of state. And um, that's where <clears throat> that's where Texas has been doing really good for me. Uh, so I invested in about 10 multifamily deals so far um, in all about over 30,000, uh, about 3,000 doors. So I also invested in self-storage and um, in <clears throat> new construction. Um, and, you know, I, I've invested in a variety of things. All in all, I'm in about 13 different um, syndication deals uh, on different type of projects. Um, my partner in crime, Dave Lin, uh, is also an investor. So he invests, uh, he has an apartment investment in China. He has um, quite a few properties in Austin. Um, and he also has um, investments here, local in the Bay Area. So <clears throat> um, like me, he also has invested in a lot of multifamily syndication deals. Uh, so we're pretty familiar with things. So um, investing in large apartments uh, require experience. And um, you know that's why I want, I, I love sharing my experience of running these, uh, operating these apartments with everybody. So Ken and Wind um, are, are Dallas partners. So they're our foot on the ground. Um, they help us evaluate deals. They go check them out. After we acquire, they also help us manage the properties. They're right there. They can go um, check it out like every week and kind of see where, how things are going. So Ken and Wynn has a pretty large portfolio. They, they're up to about 13, 13 apartments now, and they just acquired another one. So we're all in all, our, our partnership group has about 14 apartments and um, they have already sold uh, full cycle six apartments. So uh, the returns have been pretty good and um, yeah, continuing to expand the business. Cool. <clears throat> so a quick rundown on what kind of apartments we invest in. Um, you'll quickly see why uh, we invest in certain type of apartments, right? So there is the class A, which is like the newly built Mission Bay, you know, um, high ceiling, beautiful apartments with retail on the bottom. Those are class A's. Basically anything from year 2000 to 2020 is considered class A. And then there are the class B's, which are basically anything from 1975 to the year 1999. Um, they're more garden style. So you'll see that each period has a different um, look as they're building out, right? So these are low rises uh, during, built during that time. <clears throat> and then we have the class C. These tend to be the 1960s to 1970s type of deals. Um, they're typically flat roof, workforce housing. Um, so, you know, so really good. Uh, and we never invest in the ghetto. So we don't invest in class D, okay? So 
Uh, in terms of like the type of properties we invest in, we invest primarily in class B and class C. Uh, we don't invest in class A right now. Um, the reason for that is um, my philosophy is I'm a more conservative type of investor. Uh, what I'm looking for is to make sure that we don't lose money. Okay. Um, so, you know, one of my goals was during a recession, um, I want to make sure that the investment is still stable and doesn't just crash, right? So what you'll find is during a recession, class A becomes too expensive for people to afford. Um, and, you know, they move out of them. <clears throat> they move down to class B and class C, what we consider to be workforce housing. It's much more affordable. Um, you know, people during recession lose their homes and they move into class B and C, right? Um, class A becomes too expensive. People move down to class B and C. So during a recession, you know, um, these actually do pretty well. And um, this, COVID re this COVID downturn is actually real proof of that. And I'll kind of go over that. <clears throat> the nice thing about class B and C is also that there's room for improvement. You know, you can upgrade units to make them look nicer. So for a one-time uh, investment, you can increase your income by a lot, and that will increase the value of your property when you sell three years, five years down the road. So um, that's the nice thing about B and C, right? You know, you have, you're able to generate, I mean, as soon as you buy it, it's usually already profitable. So you're getting five to 6% return already. And then as you improve a property, you can increase the value when you sell. So, you know, this is typically like what a classic unit that we, we buy, okay? Um, you know, just like when you go buy a house, don't look at the condition right now. When I look at this, I actually see money, okay? I can see what I can turn it into and um, be able to increase a value, right? So we take a this and then we do what's considered a light renovation, okay? Basically change out the flooring, you know? So, <clears throat> so with that, we're able to renovate it to this level, okay? So if you kind of take a look between this and this, um, this is about a $3,000 renovation. It's not that much, um, mainly because apartments you're buying at such a large scale, right? So the cabinets are painted. I mean, this is pretty cheap. To paint the cabinets is like $150. Um, backsplash is like $80. Faucets, you know, these things, we can get them for like about 40 bucks. Granite, this piece of granite is $99, right? You know, because we buy in such large quantity, right? Um, appliances, you know, when you're buying 200, 300 appliances, uh, they get pretty cheap. Yeah, so we're able to buy a whole set of appliances, um, refrigerator, stove, and dishwasher. You can buy a whole set for about $650, right? It's, it's, it gets cheap when you, when you and other apartment operators are buying at such large quantities. And that's how we're able to renovate for so cheap. And, um, you know, on a unit like this, where for $3,000, you know, we can bump it to like a $75 increase. So uh, we can get our money back and increase the value pretty quickly. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, you know, you can also feel free to um, send any questions during the, um, <clears throat> in the chat or something like that. I, I, I love being interactive, so feel free to ask anything you want. All right, <clears throat> so moving on. I think we're almost a little bit over a year of, um, you know, when COVID actually hit the apartment business, right? And hit everybody and impacted everybody. So, so here's a look back at how uh, everything was affected. So actually, let me make this change. Um, so Q1 of 2020 uh, was actually very, very busy. Um, so 
like January of last year, there were over 30 deals, you know, um, there were so many things to pick from. Um, and, you know, we were ready to buy deals, right? So uh, in February of last year, uh, in fact, we were actually bidding on a pretty large um, 550 unit portfolio. Uh, we got into the best and final stage. We were about to win the deal. And right then is when COVID hit. Okay, so at that time, we took a very hard look to see um, should we continue with the deal? Because once you win the deal, we're putting down about half a million dollars of our own money to um, guarantee the purchase of the deal, right? So it's a tough decision, right? It was a very attractive, um, it was a very attractive deal as you guys can see. Um, 550 class B, all ready to go. Um, there's further upgrades we can do. Only about half of the units were renovated, so there was more room to go. Um, so yeah, you know that was going to be one of the larger deal that. Um, so I partnered with my um, very good friends um, Boris and Oshi on this deal, and um, yeah, so it was right in progress. But then COVID brought everything to a screeching halt. So we took a hard look at the risk that we might be taking with our investors and decided that I think it's better not to do the deal. Okay, so we, um, you know, given the market condition, there's no way we can accurately predict how this market will be and for our operations. So even though we're in best and final, uh, we're about to go into the best and best and of the finals, uh, we decided to withdraw our offer. Um, so we were not the only ones, um, you know, at that time, the COVID uh, got much worse. So majority of the deals, um, 30 plus deals were actually all taken out of the market. Uh, they were all canceled. The only deals that went forward were um, deals that were already closed, that was already in the process. You know, the contract was signed, it was already in process. So those deals took another three to four months to close. Um, but aside from that, no transactions happened in Q1 of 2020. <clears throat> Everybody just hit the brakes. Okay. So um, as soon as the COVID, COVID happened, um, your lenders get very, very worried about, about um, are you gonna be able to pay, right? So to make sure that you have the ability to pay, they offered up what's called a uh, loan for, forbearance, where you do not have to pay, um, you do not have to pay your uh, mortgage and interest for five to six months, right? Sounded great. Everybody wanted to want to you know consider doing that, but we had a we had a a, a discussion with our our um, our dust lender, basically the the lender for Fannie Mae, and we decided against it because after analyzing the terms of the forbearance, you don't want to take a forbearance. It's bad. Okay, so what is the trade off? The trade off is for five to six months of not paying mortgage and interest, um, you still owe them. They're not forgiven, right? So what is the chance of you not paying for five to six months? And then on the seventh month, you're able to now pay everything back, right? It's actually pretty tough. Um, and also it goes on the record, even though they say, no, 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 it'll be okay. But it actually goes on the record and will definitely affect your ability to take, to, to do future, um, to purchase future properties, right? Because you have now a loan forbearance on your property, right? So overall on the multifamily side, it was actually pretty good. Out of all the loans that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac gave out on the apartment side, only about 3% of the loans went into forbearance. Okay, um, which is really, really low. On the hotel side, about 
30 to 35 percent of the loans went into forbearance. Okay, and same thing on the retail. Retail was also pretty bad. It was around like 15 to 20 percent of the loans where went into forbearance. It's basically pre foreclosure, right? So, um, but apartments remain pretty strong, uh, including the collections. So it was good. Nobody really had to take it. Um, it was really designed for people who saw like a 30 to 40 percent drop in income, right? Um, so didn't happen to multifamily. Okay. So during this time, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who probably lends out about half of the commercial loans inside the U.S., um, start tightening up. Okay, uh, they were being very, very conservative. So if you wanted to buy a property, they require that you put away one year's worth of um, mortgage and interest. Okay, and then they put it into this lockbox. Okay, so. When they first started, they were so careful. They said, you have to put in your mortgage and interest, also your insurance, and also your property tax. Okay, a whole year's worth. This will be placed in our account. Okay, you cannot touch it. <clears throat> and if you still operate really well after one year, then we will watch how you do for another quarter, okay? So if you continue to do well after a year and one quarter, then we'll give you the money back. Then you can access it, okay? Otherwise, they want to keep the money with them so they feel safe to give out the loan, okay? And this destroyed deals, okay? So on a typical $20 million deal, this basically requires that, um, the person who's buying the apartment, he needs to bring an addition $1.4 million to the table. Okay. So that means that if this deal was, was projected to have an 80% return after five years, then this would drop the return down to like 66% over five years because of the extra money that everybody had to bring to the table. Okay, so yeah, it, it had a major impact. And once again, this put the brakes on a lot of the new deals. So I would say that during the first half of 2021, no transaction happened. Um, yeah, no, not, not much transaction happened, especially with this kind of lockbox requirement. So what happened what, you know, so what did we do when, as soon as we realized this COVID thing was gonna hit, okay? So um, between our partnership, we have about seven apartments that we're actively managing, right? Or actively operating. So we immediately, as a partnership, sat down and we analyzed the cash position of each property, okay? So <clears throat> typically when we purchase a property, um, we are usually pretty conservative to make sure we have enough reserves. So for example, on one of the $12 million property that we purchased, we had about $400,000 just in reserves. Okay. And that reserve is for exactly this situation. Um, when, um, when there's an economic downturn, we want to make sure that we have enough money to ride it out. Okay. Um, the worst thing to do is to ask the investors for more money. We, we don't want to do that. So we typically build up a very safe cushion ahead of time. So we evaluate each of our property and see how much money we have left uh, and devise how we should um, handle our expense going forward. Okay. <clears throat> so the model that we were, we were, um, working with is if our collections drop 40%, okay? So let's say we're only able to collect 60% of the rental money. How long can we survive by just paying mortgage and insurance? Okay, so, um, so I think based on our calculation, most of our properties, so um, of the two properties that we had, we, you know, based on the amount of reserves that we had, we could survive on the bare minimum for 12 months. 
Okay. The other property, we're actually able to survive 15 months um, because we have some uh, capital reserves there as well. So we're in pretty good shape, right? So when we looked at that and realized that, okay, if you know the crap really hits a fan, we can still survive for up to a year, okay, in the worst case for things to come back. Okay. <clears throat> So I think that's really important. Um, you might actually see some deals out there. Um, the way that they, they achieve a higher return is to not raise as much money, right? So they may only have $100,000 in the reserves, okay? Or $200,000 in the reserves. And um, that's really dangerous. I, I would not invest, personally invest in that type of deal because in a downturn like this, uh, you'll get screwed pretty quickly. <laughs> Okay, so healthy reserves, at least $300,000 to $400,000. On some of our properties, we had $800,000 in reserves on the larger ones, okay? So make sure you can survive a downturn. Um, and then the next thing is that we did is um, we paused all the capital improvements, okay? So tighten your belts, no more renovating, no more buying that you know um lawnmower that the maintenance guy wanted <laughs> so pause all your expenses okay because we're we're trying to we're, we're going into survival mode to make sure um, we can come out the other end healthy okay and uh, we immediately looked at our payroll um so typically for a 200 unit apartment you will have two uh office staff inside the office, and then you would have two maintenance guys, okay? So two inside, two outside. So during COVID, we're not, we decided to only do emergency repairs only to reduce the contact, right? So um, we decided to let, right away to let one of the, um, one of the maintenance assistance guy to let him go. Okay, we kept the office staff at full staff because we want to make sure that we can still bring new residents in um, to keep the property occupied. So we cut one quarter of our payroll uh, to begin with. Okay. Uh, I'll pause here for a quick question. What is a recommended ratio between cash reserve and income? Um, the amount of cash that you want to reserve is not necessarily based on income, but based on your expense. Okay, so um, at minimum, you want the ability to, um, just like for your personal, you want to keep at least two to three months of um, expenses. Okay, you want to have that on hand. Um, there's some, there's some things where you can delay payments on. So some of the invoices, you can kind of push them out to 90 days uh, to pay the vendors later. Uh, but things like um, payroll, things like mortgage and insurance, you just absolutely have to pay. So make sure that uh, you're able to at least survive, you know, two or three months uh, just paying that. Okay. And if you're able to raise more money when you buy a property, raise more money okay um just imagine if this was a real recession okay um where people lost jobs and you don't have enough money to operate the property because there's no more reserves and then you try out to go to investors and ask people to can you give me another hundred thousand dollars nobody's going to give you a hundred thousand dollars right because everybody's struggling in their own income so always make sure there's enough reserves when you purchase a property. You don't want to have to go out and ask for more money during the, during the bad times, okay. Uh, do you keep the reserves in a separate checking account uh, or is that, yeah. So uh, typically when we buy a property, um, we set up multiple bank accounts, okay. So one of the accounts is only we have control. Um, the property management company does not have access to it. Um, so the property management company usually work with $100,000 in the bank account. 
like a slush account, right? Um, they pay um, they pay mortgage, they pay payroll and stuff out of it. But you don't want to keep to you don't want to let them have too much money in to access, right? Because um, if they have too much money, then they feel like they can spend spend it all. So we usually only keep hundred thousand dollars there. All the extra cash flow, all of our reserves, we keep it separate in our own account. Okay. So yeah, you know, be conservative, raise extra money, make sure you can survive downturns. <clears throat> so yeah, you know, I, um, our partnerships were in good position. We knew that we could survive 12 months. Um, and we communicated that to our investors to make sure that you know everybody also feel at ease that they don't have to contribute when things are bad. So next, we decided like, um, okay, how do we prevent uh, people from catching COVID, right? So one of the first things that we did is we closed the office. Um, our staff, our office staff, still show up every single day. Um, they're in the office, but it's by appointment only, and uh, it's, it's one person only at a time, okay? So office is, you know, uh, not very accessible to prevent um, any, to prevent too much contact. Second of all, we bought full protective gear for the office staff. I mean, you know, I don't know if you see those, um, Asian, Asian, Asian mom, Asian grandma drivers, they have those masks that over their, their face. We bought like a whole box of those for our office staff. So they're nice and protected. Um, we, you know, in the start, we went to Alibaba when we ordered a lot of masks from overseas. Um, so they had like 400 masks there, um, just ready to go because just to be safe, right? Uh, during that time. And then um, we started shopping for these acrylic screens um, where the, yeah, so the staff can put it in front of it and to protect them, right? So um, we just wanted to make sure our office staff stays safe. Um, and also um, we want the residents to stay, uh, to, to, to be safe. So on the maintenance side then, we um, decided that we will only do emergency maintenance uh, work, okay? So, um, and then when our maintenance guy go to do a work order on, on that person's unit for to protect our maintenance guy and also to protect the tenants, we ask him to please go into your room, close the door. <laughs> we will come in, we'll fix your clog, we'll fix, you know, whatever's leaking. And once we're done, we'll let you know and then you can come out. Um, this minimizes contact between the maintenance guy and the tenant uh, and just safer for everybody. So um, despite all of our precautions, one of our uh, leasing agents still got caught with COVID. Not that department, but you know, through a family member. Um, so <clears throat> so when you when, when office staff gets hit with COVID, it's a big deal, right? Um, during this time, uh, so she's out for two weeks. And during this time, we don't bring in another replacement um, leasing agent because the office may, be, may, you know, may have bacteria, right? May, may have the virus. Uh, we don't want new people getting that either. So during this time, as soon as we, you know, she got diagnosed with uh, COVID, we immediately order a hazmat team. Well, not, not exactly a hazmat, but you know, um, we immediately order a deep clean of the, um, of the office. And we ask both the office manager and the leasing agent to now work from home for uh, a week. So it was a week before the office manager came back and it was two weeks until the leasing agent came back. So um, it's definitely a challenge and you don't want to see your people um, get hurt. So take good care of your staff. And um, so she was able to come out of it just fine. But that's also because Texas people are nuts. You know, they go around without masks. And so 
Okay. <clears throat> so now that um, during COVID, right, you know, so we, we closed the office, we, you know, narrowed down the, um, we narrowed down the maintenance side, okay. So that means the whole model of how you rent uh, apartments have changed, okay. So we recognize that right in the beginning that we're no longer going to be showing, doing tours of the apartment units, right. People are not, during that time, they're not coming out. They're not going to walk, right? So it, it becomes extremely important for us to have a very big online presence. Um, so because we expect all the future leasing to be done through your website. Uh, it's going to be a major component. So we, um, so we completely redesigned our website, took the opportunity, designed our, re redesigned our website to have a very attractive and easy to use. Um, we um, hired, hired the 3D modeling people to come in and do a, a walkthrough of the apartment. So if you went to our website, you're able to actually, um, you know, this, the software is called Matterport. It's basically a 360 degree camera system, right? So you can basically click on the different spots. You can go over there and you can virtually walk the entire apartment to see what it's like, right? There's a 3D um, dollhouse model, different angles. So, you know, you can even measure to see if your furniture will fit. <laughs> so it's pretty nice. It, and it, you know, we got a lot of good reviews on, um, on that and it really helped people to know what they're getting and you know, um, wanting to rent with us. Um, I don't have an example here, but I, I, you know, so we also did what's called virtual staging is where you can take one of these pictures, send it to them for virtual staging, um, uh, so basically, if you want to stage an empty unit, it costs about $2,000 a month where they bring the furniture and all that kind of stuff, right? And that's really expensive. Instead, what you can do is you can send pictures to people online and they would add furniture. They would Photoshop the furniture in um, to make it look really nice, right? And what's the cost of that? 35 bucks a picture, you know, so <laughs> it looks just the same and um, you can do like four rooms and, you know, it's like a hundred bucks, right? You know, much better than staging it for a thousand, two thousand dollars a month. Okay. <clears throat> we also redesigned the website so that um, tenants can now do their payments online. They don't have to come in through um, the front office to drop off their money. Once again, we're minimizing um, we're mi minimizing contact and you know also taking the opportunity to streamline a lot of these operations. So that worked out pretty good. And uh, finally, um, to make sure that we can keep the occupancy up, we spent more money on doing marketing. So, uh, so we advertise more on apartments.com. We use Facebook to um, also, you know, the Facebook local ads. Um, we did that. Uh, we also started advertising on a website called Zumper. Uh, apparently it's pretty popular among renters. And we did massive marketing campaigns on Craigslist. Okay, so to really increase our presence and make sure we can continue to bring people and potential um, tenants in. <clears throat> Out of these, I would say that, so to advertise on apartments.com, it'll run you about 700 to $800 a month, okay? Uh, it's quite expensive. Um, they have such big presence. Um, so one trick you can do is you can actually advertise with apartments.com for like one month and then terminate your membership. And then um, whatever you have already set up there will actually stay on apartments.com. Even though they cannot, um, even though they cannot, um, 
rent the apartments directly through that web website anymore, um, but you're still searchable. Your pictures are still there and your phone number is still there. So you can actually continue to get a lot of good benefits without having to keep paying 600 bucks every month. Um, Facebook was good. Facebook, you can target it. Uh, so for example, I mainly want to target people within 50 mile radius, right? And you know you can allocate a budget of let's say a hundred bucks, okay? And then they'll charge you on a per lead basis. How many people actually clicked on it? You know all that kind of stuff. And it'll keep going until the budget is exhausted, right? So uh, we actually found that to be pretty pretty effective. And um, I guess during COVID time, everybody's just browsing Facebook and you know, that ad shows up. So we get, we got a lot of good clicks. Um, and you can control how much you're spending, right? So let's say we're budgeting for a hundred bucks, 200 bucks a month. Um, and once it reaches that amount of hits and reaches a $200 expense, it will just stop automatically. So it's not an open-ended price. Zumper works out pretty good. Zumper, basically they charge something like $10 per lead. Um, basically every person that redirects to you, they count that as a lead, but they have a cap of no more than $200 a month. So no matter how many leads they generate for you, um, it won't be more than 200 bucks a month. So yeah, pretty good. So, um, you know, when the situation changes, um, we adapt <laughs> and we adapt. And this is actually, uh, you know, it was a very good exercise because it actually helped to increase our online presence and drive further traffic, even, even when it's not during COVID. I'll stop real quick. Any questions so far? By the way, this matter port is really cool. It looks, you know, it, it's it looks expensive, but we got the whole package. Like, we took the three D videos of all of, of two um, two units, and um, they included the entire picture package, and we got them done for three hundred bucks. And I thought that was a killer deal. Cool. All right. So now that we got the leasing out of the way. So uh, we started looking for other ways to, um, you know, get government assistance, right? So the nice thing last year is government offered what was called payroll protection plan. Um, basically, uh, uh, they give you a loan to help you pay for payroll uh, with the understanding that you probably don't have to pay this loan back. <laughs> okay, it'll be forgiven. Um, there's a few criteria for they to forgive this loan, right? One of the most important thing is um, you have to keep the same number of employees before and you know before you apply for the loan. So remember, I said that we fired one guy to to reduce the cost. So uh, in order to get that eight week of free payroll, we hired him back. <laughs> so we have four people before and we have four people during the PPP period, right? So um, in my opinion, the payroll protection program actually did exactly what it was intended to do. Uh, we maintain the same staffing level and people continue to have a job. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah. Um, as a result, we got eight weeks of payroll uh, reimbursed, and it's pretty significant amount. You know, that's like forty thousand dollars that we were reimbursed, and we would have probably had to reduce our staffing further if we didn't get this. So, um, so it's all in good, but remember, PPP had a restriction. It was designed for not for large companies, right? So even though that each of our, our apartments is an individual entity that only has like maybe no more than four or six employees, because 
we're part of this larger, um, larger property management company. Um, so our property management company is Wayner Multifamily in Dallas, and they manage 270 properties. Uh, and underneath them, they have close to, you know, five, 600 employees, right? So that means that you're considered a large company and you won't qualify for this payment protection plan even though each apartment is operating as its own entity. Okay, so um, yeah, we work pretty closely with a property management company to find exceptions um, because we are actually, each one is individual. So in the end, we were finally able to be approved. And um, yeah, so it came at a crucial time, you know, during summertime, right around June and July timeframe. Um, yeah, we, we were able to get our payroll reimbursed. Cool. So we were as prepared as we can be, right? So there's always gonna be risk during these downturns and um, you know, we're ready for the sky to fall. Um, fortunately, the sky did not fall. Um, in fact, um, apartments did way better than anybody was expecting. So remember, we were kind of projecting, you know, we were preparing for a 40% drop in collections, right? Didn't happen. Okay. I think collections dropped 6% or 8% at the most during the entire period um, of COVID. So, and this is across all of my holdings, right? So remember, I, I have invested in many, many um, apartments across my portfolio. And across my portfolio, everybody got at least 90% collections. Everybody had at least 90% occupancy during this whole period. Um, so going back, this is because apartments are really resilient during the downturn. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to this slide right here. Okay, so B and C was pretty much full during the downturn. While if you look at class A, um, if we look at some of the class A's that in San Francisco, they saw rent drops of 30%. Uh, occupancy, you know, also dropped to like 70%, right? It was, it was a bloodbath. So not only did they have to lower rent, they also started offering two months of free rent just trying to get new residents. So, you know, that is why I don't invest in class A. <laughs> I won't invest in class A unless I can pick it up for really, really cheap. Okay, so, um, but during that time, you know, the son, the daughter actually move in with their parents. Um, there will be like uh, brother, I mean, two families will move in together. Um, to fit in one of these um, B and C workforce housing. Um, whatever it takes to make sure they have a place to live, right? People are not going to buy Christmas. They're, they're, they're rather not buy Christmas presents. They'll sell their car. They'll do whatever, but they need a place to live, right? So apartment housing, paying for the rent is a high, high priority. And... Uh, I knew that going in when I was investing in apartments, um, but I'm actually happy to see that it did turn out to be what I expected, uh, that apartments maintain really good income during the downturn. Uh, quick question. Okay. <clears throat> so um, another thing that was very interesting is why was the occupancy so high? Well, it was also because during the COVID time, nobody wanted to go and look for new apartments, right? Uh, with a virus spreading around, why would you want to be moving, right? That's really scary. So uh, a side effect of that is we had a really high renewal rate. Typically for class B and C apartments, your renewal rate is about 50% every month, okay? Um, but we saw basically 70 to 80% renewal rate through this whole time. Um, 
part of that is also because during this time, we, we really took care of our tenants. Uh, we really, we provided um, basically COVID packages. Um, we went out to a dollar store, we bought like, um, you know, cleaning wipes, we bought Lysol kits, we buy basically, you know, just care packages, right? So you can assemble these care packages for like seven dollars, eight dollars. It's a whole basket of stuff, and you pass it out to residents, and they really appreciate that. So um, during that time, we focused hard on making sure the residents residents are taken care of, and um, yeah, they rewarded us by you know wanting to stay with us. Um, so yeah, eighty percent renewal rate means you don't have to look for that many new people um, because it's really hard to find new tenants during COVID time, right? During a downturn, it's really hard to find tenants. So um, if somebody moves out, you have to clean the apartment, you have to repaint it, uh, you have to sanitize it, that's probably $800, right? And then another two, two weeks of not finding somebody. So you're going to lose like $1,000 anytime somebody move out. So spend that money, keep your tenants, um, and you'll reduce your cost by a lot. Okay. So I'm also happy to say that on the property that, um, you know, we're operating, we actually hit 100% occupancy. So um, end of January of this year, we actually hit 100% occupancy. And for the past two months, we're, we're at 98% occupancy. Um, we're actually doing even better than pre-COVID. Uh, I think uh, our property was collecting $142,000 a, a month, um, you know, pre-COVID. So during February, our peak, it was like 142. Last month, we were collecting 156, no, uh, 154. Right, so we were doing we were doing even way better than pre-COVID, and we we're actually able to push rent as a result. Right, so all of this is you know, can you take care of your take care of your tenants? Right, can you make sure that they're happy with their current environment? Once you can do that, they'll be happy for you, happy to stay, and there's still organic growth in the Dallas market, in the Texas market. So you can still push rent, believe it or not. <laughs> so very happy about that. <clears throat> um, so as many of you know, during this time, there's a eviction ban going on, okay? You can't evict people, is what the government tells you. So the first thing that, um, that came around was, if you have a government loan, um, so this is like, if you get a loan from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, then um, you're not allowed to evict tenants. Okay, so not only are you not allowed to evict tenants, you also cannot charge them for any late fees. Um, so they're fully protected. Mm. So even though you can find ways to still try to evict these people, the courts were closed. <laughs> there is nobody to file the evictions with. So we were effectively um, prevented from doing any evictions um, from, from basically March all the way until July timeframe, okay? We couldn't evict anybody. So, so <clears throat> that's a reason why you pick a landlord-friendly state, okay? So in Texas, the renters know that if you don't pay, you don't play. Okay, so they're very, in their mindset, um, they need to pay the rent to make sure they have a place to live. Whereas if I talk to my friends in California, the people in California, they're going, oh, yes, okay, now is the time. How do, I, how do I get away with not paying money as long as possible? Okay, so in California, the collections is pretty terrible. Okay, people are trying to, people are too smart in California. So they're looking for all kinds of ways to um, just, you know, not pay rent, right? Texas, they're still paying, right? It's a landlord-friendly state. So even though there's an eviction ban going on, 
we were still collecting 90%. People still pay in fear of losing, losing that price. Okay. So um, the government is trying to help tenants. Okay. So it got to a point where um, in, in August timeframe, we can finally file evictions on people who has not been paying. Um, and then when we go to eviction court, the, the judge will actually tell them that, oh, you can't pay? Hey, here, just take the CDC declaration and sign it, okay? There's even lawyers who are sitting at these um, courthouses who is working for free pro bono and then helping people fill out the CDC declaration to declare that, hey, I can't pay. So it was pretty bad, okay? It was pretty bad, um, but um, we still managed to evict the people who are just taking advantage of the system. So, you know, for us, we, we, we really put our tenants first. We, if you had trouble paying, we'll try to find you government assistance. We will take um, a scheduled payment, okay? We'll, we'll try to work with you as much as possible. What we won't allow is people who just flat out take advantage of the system and not pay anything. Those people, we will do whatever it takes to get you out, okay? Because you, you know, you're abusing the system. So what does that mean? That means that um, during this time, remember there are unemployment benefits, there is stimulus checks, there's all these things coming in, right? So there's no reason why you cannot at least be making an effort or paying partial. Okay, so, <clears throat> so um, in fact, here's a funny story. Um, our mailman is pretty good friends with us, right? So our mailman will actually come into the office and say, hey, <clears throat> the stimulus checks are in today. <laughs> I'm handing them out into the mailboxes. So you, you guys should go ping your tenants today. Okay, so <laughs> our leasing agent will actually go out to the mailbox, the, the, the mailbox center and just hang around there and go, oh, hey, congratulations. You're getting, your, you're, you're getting a stimulus check today. Um, would you like to pay off your balance? <laughs> so she will actually hang out at the mailbox. She knows who's getting the, um, the checks and then, um, yeah, that actually helped to move things along and then we were able to get more collections that way. Um, but there's always going to be bad apples. There's people who didn't pay a single penny. Um, in the meantime, you know, for the landlords, right? We have massive mortgage that we continue to pay. We're still paying for their utilities. We're still paying for the office staff we're paying for everything still. It's not like we got a break, right? So, so we have our huge burdens, right? Um, and so we cannot allow anybody to think that it is okay to just not make an effort and just stay for free. So, <clears throat> so as soon as the eviction ban was over, we were able to evict about four of the really bad tenants, okay? So we cut, there was a small window where between August and September where we could evict people. We immediately got rid of those people. We we're right on it, okay. Um, and then right at that time, they said that, hey, if you do a CDC declaration saying that you were affected, um, then they cannot evict you, okay. So that's okay. We have ways around it. <laughs> so, um, the thing is, some tenants assume that the CDC, uh, the CDC orders out, that means they cannot be evicted. No, you actually have to turn in a physical form to declare that you're impacted. Under the threat of perjury, you have to sign it and declare that, no, I really don't have a job. I really can't afford to pay, this kind of stuff, right? Most people, they're too lazy to turn it in, okay? so. Um, that defense won't work. Even when people turn in their CDC declaration, we challenge those declarations. Okay, so um, 
So you can challenge them on a few things, right? One of the most critical one uh, thing is you must say, you must declare that you at least made an effort to pay for part of your rent. If for the past six months, you haven't made any, any um, payment, sorry, this declaration does not apply to you because you couldn't use your stimulus money, right? So we were able to get rid of one really nasty tenant um, that way. And she fought us, you know, tooth and nail all the way to the end, but we won, um, we won our, our, our declaration um, protest. So she had to leave. But for other people who were really affected, um, we asked them to provide evidence, right? So one thing to keep in mind is that we're not trying to be mean. We're not trying to um, put people out on the street, okay? But you have to make an example, okay? You have to show people that um, we will challenge your declaration. So you have to prove you are affected. Otherwise, you know what happened at other, other apartments I, I know? Um, one person turns a CDC declaration and don't have to pay, right? They immediately tell their neighbor. The neighbor does the same thing. Pretty soon you have like one, one third of your tenants all turning in declarations saying that, oh, I don't have to pay. You can't touch me, right? So we're basically telling them that, no, this is not a free ride, okay? We will challenge you to prove it, okay? And all it takes is really, for example, that one really bad tenant that we got rid of. Um, so when the way that Texas do the eviction is, if you if you are declared that you're the court rules that you are to be evicted, on the day of eviction, we would move all your stuff to the outside of the unit. Okay, so we would go in, take all your belongings. If you have not moved already, take all your belongings set it on the sidewalk, change a lock, and you have one day to collect your belongings. Um, and, and, you know, when that stuff is set out on the sidewalk, everybody in the apartment walks by and they can see and they know what happened, right? And that tells them that, no, this apartment, they don't mess around. Make sure you pay, otherwise you'll be evicted, right? when the truth is we will try to work with people. Um, as long as you're making the effort to pay, nobody else got evicted, right? But it's mainly to show that you can't just take advantage of the situation. And these people know, you know, these people know they, they gain the system all the way until the last minute because from the time that you lose your eviction to, to actually being moved out, it's two weeks. Uh, you still have time to collect your belongings and go, right? But some people choose to, you know, fight it to the last minute. And then, yeah. So we will set their stuff out on the sidewalk. If you don't collect it within 24 hours, it goes in the dumpster. <laughs> so. Okay. And then there are those people who really try to game the system and, uh, you know, um, later on, there was an order that you cannot do evictions if it is due to um, not paying rent, okay? You cannot evict people if they haven't paid rent was the order, okay? So, but for the really nasty people, then we will find other ways to evict them. So in Texas, if you have three lease violations, then the landlord can take a repossession of the unit. So that's another way for you to evict somebody without going through the rent collection route. So what can you nail them for? Well, you know, if they always have trash in their patio, that's a lease violation. If you have loud music at night, that's a lease violation. If you walk your dog around the property and you don't clean up after the dog, that's a lease violation, right? So, um, you know, for the tenants that are not ideal, it's not hard to find three lease violations. And um, yeah, you could also get the people out that way. Um, so yeah, it, it worked. Um, we didn't have to evict too many people. I would say 
really only four to five people, but that made sure that the rest of the people paid. And um, yeah. Okay, any questions? So I know that Flora, I mean, um, and other people have told me before, it's like, oh my God, this sounds so mean, right? You're still evicting people. Um, but once again, you know, we're not punishing the good people. We're punishing the people who are taking advantage of the system, right? So, okay. Cool. So why I say that we're trying to help the residents, this is part of it. Uh, so remember, along with the stimulus bills, the government also provide assistance, rent assistance, right? So, you know, the whole Texas uh, will get large funding, which they pass on to the county, okay? And these were a godsend. Um, so in um, October of last year, um, they started getting their funding, okay? And they came and then they basically told us that, hey, you can help your residents apply for rent relief, okay? And then we will pay their rent uh, for 2020. So it was October and they said that we will even pay any back rent that they owed from March to now, right? So we will pay everything from March all the way, all the way to December. Okay, if they can show that they were impacted. So that's awesome, right? You know, that's, that, that, that was really great. And the money goes directly to the landlord. Um, it doesn't go to the renter because you know, if the money goes to the renters, uh, they're gonna spend it on something else. <laughs> okay, so the money goes directly to the landlord. So um, it was great. Uh, because we have a large portfolio, remember we were running seven apartments. So the county officials actually came to our property and, and they were there the entire day. And all the renters from the area would come to our property to do the signups, uh, to sign up for the rent assistance. And, um, and of course our residents was able to get processed like the same day approved the same day. So it was extremely streamlined. And that's really because of the size of our portfolio that we're able to do that. Um, so I think on average, we had about um, 10 to 15 people who qualified um, per property. And, you know, it's a quite a significant account, amount. So I think um, so far on one of our properties, we've already received $32,000 in back pay and probably gonna get another $10,000 more. So it really helps out, okay? And it really helps out the tenant because they don't have such a large balance that they have to keep struggling with month to month, okay? So if somebody told you that the government is gonna come and pay for nine months of your rent, okay? If you're owing $4,000, $5,000, the government's gonna come in and pay everything. You would think the tenants would go and apply for that money, okay? But the truth is they didn't. And that was driving me nuts, okay? So we would have like 20, 20 residents who's behind and we tell them that, hey, you can get free money, just apply for it. For whatever reason, they didn't bother half of the people did not bother even applying. Um, just had to get into their mindset. I, I personally think that last year with all these new government, it's so lazy. They really into an entitlement feeling. It's like, yeah, I'm not gonna do anything. Money should just be mailed to me off. <laughs> so, um, we so we did everything we can we filled out the forms for them we put it into a envelope with a postage with little notes saying just sign here <laughs> and then just drop it off in a mailbox and you're done right uh, the tenants still did not apply 
long back. I'm at Oscar Awards for a lot of people. Um, you know, easy. And then some people said that, hey, um, you know, they asked me to show my W-2. Um, they asked me to show proof of unemployment. That's too much trouble. Forget it. Okay. There's people that says that, um, well, I don't want to expose who else is in my family, right? You know, that's actually living on a property. So I'm not going to fill it. Uh, there's a bunch of reasons. So we made a very clear decision that if you have a balance and you're not applying for uh, any of these free government assistance, then we're evicting you, right? So if you're not paying and you're turning away free money, then yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna pay even when you have money. So we we made it very clear. So we put thirty day notice um, that they will be evicted, and that got some people to move and start applying. Um, but still, a lot of people just decided that mm, whatever, I'm just gonna stay at home and not do anything. So madness. Um, so Tracy asked, is a rent assistance a national program? Um, it is. So the federal government pro provide this um, funding for rental assistance to each of the states. So each of the states then allocates the money to each of the counties. Okay. So the counties will be able to um, provide the money or the county also distributes money down to the city level, okay? So it all comes from the federal, down to the state, county, and uh, city. So for example, um, the city of Arlington in Texas, um, in December, they got $30 million for that one city, uh, $30 million in free rent, right? You can just apply and then you'll get it. Um, so they have plenty of money to help out, okay? Before that, there were also church groups that were um, helping out. There were other, um, you know, uh, housing groups that was helping out. So what we did is we, we, we made a list of all the assistance programs that will help pay your rent and we pass them out to all of the renters. Actually, no, I take that back. We passed it out to the renters who were, who had a balance, okay, because one thing I realized through this experience is once the renters are used to relying on government to pay their rent, um, it's a bad habit to break. And they get so lazy once they feel like somebody is going to solve their problem and they don't look for work. They don't uh, try very hard to get off the program. Right? This is the welfare issue. Once people get on welfare, they don't want to come off of it. So we only pass it out, these rental assistance out to people who really needed it, okay? If they're, I mean, remember 90, 80% of the residents were paying on time. Well, don't, don't show them that. Don't, don't, don't tell them there's free money, no. Make sure they continue to pay. It's a, it's a good habit, okay? So what is the qualification for rent assistance? Um, it's really light, okay? Literally, if you have, if you owe a balance and you say that I was affected by COVID, uh, that's it, you qualify, right? So, um, of course, they look at whether or not you still have an income. If you still have an income, then you may not qualify for the full amount, right? Um, but it's a really, really low bar, right? Just say that. I'm breathing and then you get free money, <laughs> so. Can the landlord help tenant to apply? That's exactly what we did. So it's a two-step process, right? So the tenant has to apply first, and then the government will come and verify verify the balance with the um, with the apartment complex, right? So tenant says, "I need assistance." Hey, I need assistance, and I owe five thousand dollars. So they'll go, they'll, they'll double check with the apartment and says, "Is he really a resident?" Does he really owe $5,000? Yes, okay, then we will pay, okay. So 
yeah, like I said, we filled out the form for them. Here you go, Mr. Tenant. Everything's filled out. Okay, just include some information. Boom, there you go. You should have it. Oh. But you still require the tenant signature. You you can't just send in the form and get free money. Oh, the government was trying to prevent that as well. Okay. Any questions? Moving on. So when we talk about the song of fire and ice, here's the ice part. <laughs> so on top of everything that happened during COVID, all that kind of stuff, uh, Texas got hit with a pretty bad um, uh, winter freeze, as everybody knows, right? So um, it got really cold. It, it got really cold. and. Um, uh, lots of issues, especially with the bursting water pipes, um, as you saw, as you can see um, on the ceiling, when the pipe burst, um, what the maintenance guy would come, the first thing he does is he tears open the roof, uh, the, the ceiling to see where the leak is coming so that he can stop it. Okay. And then so you'll get insulation all over, the place is wet, all that kind of stuff. So excess freeze. So um, we knew the freeze was coming, okay? We knew the temperature was gonna drop. So we actually took a number of precautions uh, in order to make sure that we don't get hit with the issues as bad. So the first thing is we asked the residents to keep their faucet on a drip, 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 drip. So as long as the water is moving through the pipes, it won't freeze. Um, so, um, so, you know, all the residents, they're dripping um, either one or two faucets and that usually, you know, prevented any problems. <clears throat> we also, you know, even though nobody was using the pool, we kept the pool motor running throughout the entire time, okay? Um, that pre prevents it from freezing up. Um, we also kept our, um, our cooling system running the entire time um, it's running heat water at that time so um, the main thing is during if you see an upcoming freeze you just need to make sure the waters are circulating so you it won't freeze and won't cause you big problems okay so that actually worked out really well um, for the first four days for the first four days of the freeze um, we did not have any issues there was no water pipe breaking there was, um, we were lucky. Um, we didn't have any electrical outage during this time. So the residents were warm. Um, they were able to cook. They're able to do everything. Um, they had running water, uh, no issues whatsoever. Um, we also had our power transformer replaced during, you know, about a month before, uh, no, about a year before by the city. So we were actually on a pretty good system. Okay, so no issues um, and no electrical outage until the fifth day. Okay, so even though the apartment did really well, eventually um, the, the pipe burst at the utilities level. Okay, so uh, at that time, then the water, there, there was actual water outage for a day. And one day was all it took. Um, so when, when there was no more running water for one day, then we actually had pipes that started, um, uh, freezing up. Okay. And, um, so when it froze, you know, it's okay. It's when they turn the water back on the city, turned it back on like full, full flow right afterwards. And that was too much pressure. And that actually ended up in pipe bursting. So most of the problems that Texas saw was not from the initial freezing. It was actually about fifth day to sixth day when the city turned back down the water uh, and the problem hit. Okay, so that was actually interesting. I mean, remember this is Texas, it's hot, it's humid, and yet you see a winter wonderland. 
<laughs> that, that 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 was hilarious for me. <laughs> so you know what was the aftermath, right? Um, believe it or not, class B and C did not get affected that much. It was a class A that got hit really, really bad. So why did class A get hit really bad? Because on the newer builds, they have the fire sprinkler system. The fire sprinkler system are extremely high pressure. Okay, so um, when those pipes burst, the water, the volume of water that came out, um, the, the pressure at which it came out was just massive. Um, I have friends' property where the, the fire sprinkler burst and the water literally cut a hole through the drywall. You know, that's how strong the water force was. So class A, you know, you, you was actually hit really hard. Just massive floods everywhere. Um, for class B and class C, uh, most of the pipes were actually indoors and it wasn't that high of a pressure. So um, there wasn't that much damage. So across my portfolio, um, we had different, different levels of damage, okay? So I think the worst one was um, 17 buildings out of 25 lost water as a result of um, this breakage, okay? Um, and the one that fared the most, the, the, the best, uh, the water fountain. <laughs> the water fountain in the front uh, of the apartment had a pipe burst. Yeah, so thank God, right? That's it. It, it was an ugly fountain anyways. <laughs> so there, it, it was a fountain that was gonna be replaced anyway, so whatever. <laughs> so got away with almost no damage, okay? Um, so for some of my properties, I think we had um, four pipes that were burst um, because we actually had a maintenance guy that lived on the property, he was able to go really quickly and turn those off and repair those pipes really quickly. Um, only one pipe was a little bit bad. Um, and we replaced the ceiling, we replaced the floor, about $3,000 of worth of damage. And that was it. So we, we, we didn't get hit really hard. <clears throat> So um, what is a lesson, right? What is a lesson from this? Is that when you know that you have one of these deep freeze um, events coming, make sure you find the water shutoff valves ahead of time, okay? So that one building, where, that one apartment where I said was underprepared and ended up with 17 buildings without water for three days, is because they did not know where the shutoff valves were and they didn't test it ahead of time. So what happened was usually um, for one building, there's a master shutoff valve for one side of a building, okay? Sometimes there's even shutoff valves for individual units. If not for individual units, there's usually a master shutoff valve for the building. If there's not a master shutoff valve for the building, there's usually like a master shutoff valve for three to four of those buildings, right? So those people, they didn't know, I mean, the, the maintenance crew at that property had no idea what to do, right? So they panicked. And then, so when things were leaking and they couldn't find the valve, they went out and turned off an entire side, an entire side of the property. So half of the buildings were without water. And when, when they did that, and then later turned it back on, they didn't do it slowly. They just turned it back on and boom, it's like pipes bursted everywhere. Okay. So yeah. So, you know, lesson learned is make sure that try out your shutoff valve early. If there is no shutoff valve per building, it's a pretty good idea to install them. So you don't end up turning off half of the property um, um, because a resident gets really pissed and um, they will leave and many people left, right? So, um, so 
so what happened during the time, right? So what happened during, you know, when there was actually no water, no, no something. So it was, it was pretty funny. So people actually went to the swim, swimming pool, got buckets of water and filled it and, and, and filled the toilet containers with it. Because um, at that time there was no, there was no water to flush with, right? So people went to the swimming pool, they also took buckets of um, snow and then they start melting it. Um, you know, they boiled it and then, yeah, that's their drinking water. And then, um, so it looked like this for a few days and all of a sudden, you know, when I was looking at the camera the next day, it's like, oh my God, people are like just, you know, carving snow out of everywhere and then for their own use. It's pretty funny. And then um, most recently, we had a fire in one of our properties, okay? Um, so if you operate an apartment long enough, three things will happen, okay? One, you will have a fire. It's almost guaranteed. You'll definitely have a fire in one of your properties. You own enough units, it's gonna happen. Um, the second, uh, somebody is gonna die in your apartment. Okay, so it's a fact of life, you know, so, you know, somebody will just pass away and um, it's pretty sad, but it'll happen. And the third thing that will definitely happen is somebody will get shot. Okay, so own, a, own enough units for a long enough time, there will be a fire, somebody will pass away, and there will be a gun, gunshot incident. It's Texas after all. So, and I've, I've seen all three happen. So in this case, uh, we were pretty lucky. Um, it, was a, it was a pretty good fire, but it was limited to just one um, building, okay? So this resident actually had a little bit of mental issue um, and he was, you know, he had a, uh, uh, he, he actually had an e-cigarette and then uh, he was using it and then he left it in the dresser with all his clothing. Um, Dresser caught fire, sets fire to the rest of the unit. He kind of watched it. And then, and then he didn't know what to do. So he actually clo um, closed the door. So, so he left his apartment, closed the door, and then he went strolling around the property. So we saw him on his camera. Um, so he, um, yeah, it was pretty bad because, you know, because he wanted to smoke. So he actually removed the smoke detectors. That's why it didn't go off, right? And then when 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 the fire started, he just he didn't know what to do, so he closed the door and then he ran away. But later he came back to check it out. It just yeah. Um, fortunately, um, it was a small fire, um, mostly smoke damage. Um, this looks bad, right? It looks pretty bad, but you know what? Uh, we we checked out the studs, we checked out the wiring. Um, we checked out the framing to see if anything was damaged. Um, it actually wasn't that bad. So, <clears throat> so ended up being about just $7,000 to do the repairs, right? Um, so basically change out the electrical, change out the, the sheetrock, okay? Um, new paint. We also reinstalled the flooring. We took this opportunity to also replace the flooring. It was an old one. Um, and, you know, when you have a fire like this, you usually have to replace the, the AC unit that's above the uh, ceiling. And um, you also want to flush out all the smoke that is now in your HVAC um, duct, right? So, yeah, it was, it was, it's a, you know, he did pretty good damage, but, you know, um, it's manageable, it happens. So we couldn't claim insurance on this. Um, the reason being insurance on apartments uh, is really designed for major disasters, right? So we had a $25,000 deductible. Um, this is under $25,000 damage. So we will be paying it out of pocket. <clears throat> uh, so we got multiple quotes. So remember, um, 
when you have larger large projects like this, make sure you get multiple quotes on everything. Um, first quote that we got was $37,000. Okay, yeah, just ridiculous. They were gonna replace appliances, all this kind of stuff. It's like, why? You know, those were not affected. Um, so $37,000 because they, they know that our deductible was 25. So they were gonna claim insurance and then, um, you know, we wouldn't have to pay anything. And then it's, a, it's an insurance scam. Um, second quote came in and it was on um, 24,000, right? It was 24,000. And um, they're saying, oh, we had to change out all the framing, all the studs. Um, but I knew we didn't have to, you know, you can see it was just a small, mostly smoke damage, right? So the frames are good. You don't have to replace it. And then we got the contractor who usually work with us. And then he said that, oh, I can do everything for $17,000, right? So most people would go like, hey, $17,000, oh, much better than 34. So yeah, let's go ahead and do it, right? But because I know how much these things should cost, um, um, I knew that was still too high. So we went out and continued to get bids, right? So finally, um, we had a vendor that we worked with a pretty long time too, and he came in and he gave an honest quote, okay? So to remove the drywall, put a new drywall, fix electrical, do the whole unit, flooring, everything, paint, $7,000, right? So that's more in line of what we're thinking of. And um, we're still gonna be cutting out all the drywalls on the ceiling, on the rooms, but yeah. So get multiple quotes. I mean, going from like $34,000 down to $7,000, that's a huge difference. Okay. Uh, cool. Didn't the tenant have insurance to cover the damage? Um, no, um, tenant insurance is not really a thing uh, in Texas. So um, no, this was not covered. Especially, you know, renter's insurance is more common in class A, in class A units. In class B and C, uh, renter insurance can get really, really high. So it's not a popular thing. Um, so, but, you know, we, we, we build this back to the tenant. Uh, you know, to make sure he covers it. So as soon as this happened, uh, we let the resident go. We don't want somebody like that on our property. So uh, yeah, uh, so it will be billed. So after everything's done, he'll receive the bill. This is how much you owe. Um, he actually moved back with his mom, um, which is a good thing because I think for him, it's a little scary for him to be living by himself uh, if he's mentally challenged. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so Susan asked, um, how do you choose a good property management company in California? So um, I, I guess this question can kind of go two ways, right? Because if you're looking for single family um, property management company, it's very different than a commercial rental management company, okay? So the kind that we use here is, um, is commercial, uh, large apartments, they manage over, you know, each apartment is at least 100 units, right? So they're very streamlined. Um, and usually the question, the number one question I ask that um, these property ma management company is, do you have enough staff? Okay, so um, the thing is, if the property management company is good and is big, um, they have a lot of staff you can rotate through. So for example, if I find that my office manager is not effective, I don't wait, I will fire him, okay, or her. I would fire them and then the property management company is able to send me a new person right away. Um, and then if that person doesn't work out, you can keep replacing them until you find one that's good, right? 
And sometimes the person that was really good in the beginning would their performance will also drop off and then you need to replace them, okay? Uh, it's an ongoing thing. And um, same thing on the maintenance side. So if they don't have a good pool of personnel to draw from, you're gonna have major problems. Uh, um, that's what I actually find to be the most important for me, that um, I can always be sure that if there's extra workload, they have people that they can send to my property to, to quickly finish them, okay, to help, to, to, to do a temporary help. Um, they have a large pool of talent that I can draw from, right? And so for like Wayner, Wayner has 270 properties or actually 170 um, properties are currently managing, right? And these apartments constantly get sold, right? So um, when the company, when, when the property gets sold, then that office manager who was proven to be good is now available to, um, you know, you can take them and try them out at your property. So having a large diversified pool to draw on is so important. Um, some of these smaller property management companies, you know, they manage five, six properties. Every time that you want them to get a new person, they had to go out and interview. Um, they had to find people. People don't want to work for them because they're too small. Yada, yada, yada. So it could be like a month or two before you can replace your underperforming uh, staff, right? And that costs money. Time is money. So um, I usually want to make sure they have good size. They have a lot of experience and um, they're able to react pretty quickly. Yeah. So on the residential side, on the residential side, what I like to find is um, um, property management companies that have their own main team. So when I was looking to buy single family homes in um, Dallas and Austin, I was interviewing property management companies. And one of the thing is, one of the things I look for is, do you have your own small maintenance team? Okay. Um, they usually keep like two to three people on staff, right? So now you don't have to pay $250, $300 every time the toilet is clogged or there's an electrical problem, right? They have their own team that can come out and do it much cheaper. Um, and I find that to be a pretty big advantage. Leasing wise, it's all the same, you know, um, and then rent collection side, they're all the same. You know, no, no one property management company is particularly better than the other. So um, them being responsive, them knowing like, you know, during this COVID time, what they need to help you apply for government assistance programs, right? So that's quite important. And um, having their own team really just helps. How do you decide how much rent you can charge for the new tenant during COVID time? That's a good question. So how do you know how much you can push rent? Well, you keep pushing until they stop coming. <laughs> that's, that's the strategy I use. So, um, um, so if I have a new unit available, you know, I tell my, I, I tell my office manager, it's like, just raise it 20, 20 bucks, okay? Um, and see if it goes, oh, it rented out. Okay, great. Let's next one, let's raise another $20. Oh, there's still demand for it. Okay, let's just keep going, right? Let's just keep pushing. And then when there's nobody renting it for two weeks, okay, then I think we should back off a little bit. <laughs> but um, you let the market decide, right? You, you more or less let the market decide. Um, even though, um, but for the most part, we know how much our rent is. Um, so once every two to three months, um, we ask our office managers to do a market survey. Uh, so they will go out and check all the prices of the apartments around us, um, see how much they're charging, see if it's an upgraded unit or not, and then see how that compares to our rent, right? So. You know, sometimes you'll find that, oh my God, you know, the other people around us has already raised rent by like $30, right? 
uh, and they're still pretty occupied then, then that means, yeah, it's probably good time for us to go up as well. Right? So, but in the end, it all comes down to occupancy, okay? If you are at 80, 85% occupancy, you can't raise rent. In fact, you need to decrease rent until you get to above 90% occupancy, right? Um, why are we able to push rent? Well, we're pretty much full, right? So we're at 95 to 98% uh, occupancy. We're full. So we're not, we're not in desperate need of people moving in, then that's the time that you test the market, right? So you only have like two to three units available a month, then try to market, you know, and see what you get, so. Cool, that's all I have. Um, I, yeah, feel free to ask me any questions. You know, go ahead and speak on the microphone if you like. Uh, anybody, feel free to chime in. But, uh, I hope this was interesting. Anybody have any questions? That was very interesting, uh, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jyotan here. Yeah. yeah. Nice story. Nice story, and like really good information about how the whole thing happened, and uh, financial aspects and assistance and so on. Yeah. Very illum illuminating. <laughs> so right. I mean, I think you know that's what it is about apartments. Is it, it all comes down to, um, you know, it's. I, I, I sometimes tell people running an apartment is like going through a school of hard knocks. Um, there's gonna be things that happen, right? And, you know, it's really based on, have you encountered this kind of problem before? Uh, are you able to react to it, right? So um, for example, I was actually really happy with, the, with this online marketing model. Um, if you look in the Bay Area, if you look at this, the businesses that actually end up doing well are the businesses that can pivot when the times get tough, right? One of my favorite um, Chinese restaurants um, during this time took the opportunity to develop a whole new line of um, different kinds of food for people to try. They also started their own delivery service. And now their business is even better than before, right? So it's the, ability to look at the bad situation, pivot, and actually do better. So um, I actually found this pretty enjoyable. <laughs> uh, one question, did you miss or halt any distribution during COVID? Yes, we did. Okay, so um, one thing that we told our investor right away when COVID started is uh, we're gonna halt distributions. Okay, it doesn't make sense for you to keep distributing money um, when, when you don't know what the future holds, right? So when something, when the economy goes bad and then the future is uncertain, um, you want to hoard the money, okay? And you can always pay out and, and catch up later on, right? But, um, you know, one of my deals, I thought it was pretty dumb, they, in order to look good, in order to look good, they continue to pay out distributions. So basically the profit, right? And, and I actually thought that they got lucky, right? The, you know, end of the apartment didn't get affected that much. But man, you know, if you just distribute, if you distribute just for the sake of looking good and now you have no money and the economy turns worse, so you'll end up in a situation where here you go, here's some profit, profit. And then two months later is like, ooh, I know I just gave you money, but now I need you to give me $100,000. Otherwise we die. That's just stupid. Right? Why would you do that? Hold on to the money. Make sure we as a group can survive through this downturn and then distribute. You know, So hoard the money. If you don't need it, great. It will be a big distribution when all of this is over. 
right? People will still get their money. But if you don't hold on to money, um, yeah, you know, you won't survive. So, so in this syndication business, some of it is like, just look good, it's face, but um, i rather do it the conservative way, yeah. Uh, what is your recurring meeting and interaction with a property manager and management company? So um, with, so I have basically a, a weekly meeting, a weekly meeting with my um, office manager, okay? But, you know, like any company, you have a weekly team sync, but you don't wait until the weekly meeting to handle things, right? So um, I think, for my properties, I chat with the office manager probably three to four times a day, you know, just through text, right? We're sharing pictures, we're, we're talking about what's going on. Um, and then that happens throughout the week. We exchange emails, that's just a constant thing. We, we know exactly what's going on. And then the weekly meeting is more like, okay, what are some major issues um, that we want to take care of? Um, do we want to consider raising rent? Do we want to, you know, consider spending the large budget to um, you know, buy a playground or something like that? We, we talk about the bigger projects during our weekly meetings. Uh, because usually if there's like a something we need to take care of, we, we, we just talk that day. So, yeah. So the way, and the way we hold the meetings is, um, show you this. But, um, uh, yeah. Anyways, we have a spreadsheet where we have all the <clears throat> all the things we want to cover that that week, right? So, um, I provide a spreadsheet to them ahead of time, usually over the weekend, and it has questions I want to ask, like, okay, how's our occupancy? How's our renewal rate? Um, you know, um, any emergencies that we need to know of? You know, and how's our how is our rent comparing to other people, right? So I usually provide them this spreadsheet to fill out um, by Sunday, okay? And then we meet every Tuesday. So they have some time to fill it up. And then, you know, if there's anything urgent, we usually discuss it before the meeting. And this way, when we come to the actual meeting, we can be more efficient. We just go over line by line. Like, did, the, did the balloons arrive? Do you guys need a new printer? Um, you know, when are we gonna, uh, open up swimming pool to everybody. Well, we talk about all those things. So the meetings, we start off by talking about the maintenance issues, and then we move on to the rent collections uh, and marketing. Each meeting, I would say, uh, because I'm a little anal, so we usually talk anywhere from one and a half hour to two hours uh, on Tuesdays, uh, just kind of covering everything. So I, and then I generally spend anywhere from 10 to 15 hours a week per property uh, to make sure that it's running good. Okay. What is the average target holding time for an apartment complex before selling? Um, it really depends, right? It really depends on the market. So usually um, when we offer these deals, these are long-term investments. So we want to try to double everybody's investments, right? And that could be anywhere from five years to seven years uh, is our target to double people's money. Um, right now, you know, if you, so, but, but that's, a, that's a projection, right? If the markets are, if the economy is not good, like for example, you hit a, 2008, 2009 recession, or if you hit something like a COVID, um, that could impact your timing, right? So instead of a six-year hold, maybe it's now an eight-year hold before we hit our target. Um, in the past few years in Dallas, um, things have been going really, really good. So, you know, we see, we see projects that double the money within three years, right? So, Roughly, we guide toward about six to seven years. It could happen sooner. It could also happen later, right? Um, so that's the average hold time. But 
our, we, but we're not fixed on like, oh, we're gonna sell it definitely by this date or something like that. Um, we're, we will look at the market, right? Um, if the market makes sense, if we think that right now is a good time to sell, we might, right? We might do it early, even though we haven't hit, hit the original, right? So for example, right now um, on one of the property, we're having really, really good income. Um, and um, right now the market is you know, very hot. It's a good time to sell. So even though we don't hit our six year, seven year mark, we might think that, yeah, now is the best time to sell to get the most out of our um, return. So, um, but, the, but, but we'll share it with the investors and everybody take a vote on whether or not um, we want to sell as a whole, uh, as a whole group. Good question. Yeah. Hi, Tony. Uh, my name is Eldwin. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, Eldwin. Oh, yeah. Hey. Uh, if I have future questions about syndications, is there a way to contact you? Yeah. Um, you can email us at um, linkmultiinvest at gmail.com. Um, I'll also send out the slide. Let me just let me just send. Yeah, you can awesome. you can reach Thank me you. on that email. So I'm happy to chat. Awesome. Uh, you know, if you have questions about syndications, um, you know, if you're, you know, there's a lot of people who are new to how syndications are formed. Uh, I also have uh, a presentation slide. Yeah. Um, new question. What is my preferred loan structure? That's a great question. <laughs> so, when we buy these properties, um, let's say it's a $20 million deal, right? Um, uh, the bank, Fannie Mae, puts in anywhere from 70 to 80% of the loan, right? So, which is, which is a lot of money, right? Um, so you're, you, know, you can get different types of loans. There's loans that go for 10 years. The rate is guaranteed for 10 years, 12 years, or shorter, right? So we have traditionally been very conservative. So we have always go, gone for the 10 year or 12 year loan, okay? Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that's the best choice every single time, okay? So because these loans have high prepayment penalty. So for example, like one of my property is doing really well, um, is a great time to sell, but if I sell, there's two and a half million dollars worth of penalty that I had to pay. Okay, so um, then it doesn't work out so well. So, <clears throat> so we're now more flexible on the kind of loans that we look for. Uh, so there's also, um, you know, Freddie Mac offers uh, a shorter loan uh, that has a floating rate that you can put a cap on on how much the rate increase. Um, and those have very low um, prepayment penalties, right? So generally for non-recourse loans, we prefer 10 years, okay? But now, you know, um, now there's a lot of new lenders that have very, very competitive rates. Um, they're also much more willing to lend. So um, yeah, we're, we're not completely fixated on 10 years. We'll look at what's best for each deal, right? So. Certain deals, for example, that requires a lot of renovation, then maybe a three-year bridge uh, is actually a very good option, right? Um, on a class A product, you know, you want to hold it for like 10 years, 20 years, then uh, a 12-year uh, Fannie Mae loan would be a great thing to do on those deals. So it depends on each of the apartment that you buy. Well, if you're shy and you want to ask questions, but you don't want to ask in front of everybody, feel, feel free to just email me or contact me. Um, I'm happy to chat, okay? 
And um, don't forget, make sure that you sign up to the to the email list because um, you know if there's deals, there's like I said, there's a lot of opportunities out there right now. Um, make sure that you get in contact with me. So that will also help me to see who's interested and how big of a property I can go for, right? So the more people who are interested, um, the bigger properties and more efficient we can buy, right? So instead of like, um, instead of like an 80 unit, we can now buy like a 200 unit deal uh, or even like a 300 to $400 um, deal, uh, 300, 400 unit deal. Or we can now start consider buying class A's which could be on the cheap right now, right? So the more people we have in our group, the, the better returns we actually get, so. Cool. Well, I hope, I hope this helps. Um, there's a lot more stories, so <laughs> feel free to chat. Okay, take care, everybody. Thanks, everybody.